Well, hi, everybody. This is Michael. Thank you for coming back. And for those of you that are brand new, welcome to the Dreamers and Doers podcast, episode number 38. We are 38 episodes now and going strong of encouraging the young dreamer and also to the older dreamers out there. <laughs> Love that. Thank you. Older dreamers, younger dreamers. Hey, our hope is that with Dreamers and Doers that each week our special guest is going to connect with you wherever you find yourself today. And they're going to inspire you to become the best version of yourself for tomorrow. Michael, I love gifts. Like I, I really do. I love present wrapping. I love giving the gifts away. I love receiving gifts. I'm not going to lie. Um, but this month, we're going to be curating gifts to consider for the upcoming holidays. And so we're calling it the gift of leadership. Um, and so we had some ideas for our listeners out there of really great gifts uh, to really cultivate the leader inside of our students. I absolutely love that. And just a little personal affirmation for you, Carolyn. You do a fabulous job in finding unique gifts that actually people would want to receive. <laughs> Thank you. I try to keep it quirky, but practical. I <laughs> so practical, but yeah. <laughs> and all within budget, right? Within budget, of course, of course. Okay, well, let's kick this off then with a first recommendation. And surprise, surprise, we're going to talk about a group of kids and they call themselves Wristworld. But their company name is Realtech. But who better to create a line of toys than kids themselves? And so what these kiddos have done, primarily middle school and mm -hmm. high school age students, is they've created a series of collectible wristbands. Yes, those of you that are watching, you might remember the slap bracelets. Well, we're bringing those back in style using augmented reality. And so essentially you can wear now using augmented reality, a video game on your wrist. Carolyn, I'm sensing as I'm saying that students are leaning in and parents are rolling their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking that's all we need is another video game. But last year, uh, our students, these middle school students and high school students released their product, uh, which was very exciting. So it was a, a group of four wristbands, a, a box set. And this year, they're getting ready to release a brand new wristband. And it's, uh, it's involving a licensing agreement with a character by the name of Hatsune Miku. What is Hatsinu Miku? Well, Miku is a Vocaloid and she can sing and she can dance, but Wristworld has given you the opportunity to wear her on your wrist. And so that's gonna be available in just a couple of weeks. Carolyn, what do you have your eyes set on this holiday season? So Michael, I have a really neat action figure, um, or I should say line of action figures in mind. And it's called I Am Elemental. And these are the first female action figures created with character and not characters first in mind. And so what that means is that when you pick up these particular action figures, um, you're going to pick up superpower character traits like honesty, courage, and Ooh, wisdom. It's like, we, it's like we set that up. Oh, man. Good Good, good call there, Michael. You like that? <laughs> well, the whole idea of this is that, you know, the action figures themselves are not the superhero, but rather the child playing with them is. And so it's really neat. It's the character traits that the, the kid wields. Uh, uh, and so that's really cool. It's totally changing the way that we think about how superhero figures are perceived um, to also how they influence our kids. Um, so I think it's really neat uh, the way that I Am Elemental does it in a positive and very intentional way. No, absolutely. And both of these recommend recommendations that we curated technically would be considered and fall under the category of toys, but students and parents, professionals that are watching, we want you to know that they are much more than that. And I just love the opportunity of even thinking me personally, Carolyn, that my kiddos have the opportunity to have something that is meaningful and also that could, you use the word influence, could really influence them in a positive way. So we would love to hear what toy, positive toy, do you have your eyes set on that we should consider uh, to add to our stocking this year. Drop that in the comment chat box below. I hope one of our students finds a way to uh, to make a PS5 leadership based. Uh, let's do it. That would be special. 
<laughs> and that brings us to our roll call time as well. So if you are here listening, let us know that you're here. Check in with us um, and answer that question. What's a toy um, or game that you feel like, hey, everyone should have this particular season? We also have a fun question of the day, Michael, and this is a throwback question. Okay. So, well, it could be a throwback question. Um, this one is, what was your favorite toy or game growing up? So what's your favorite toy or game growing up? Wow. That, Michael, that wasn't that long ago. That so. not, not that long ago. Thank <laughs> you for making me feel younger than how I feel. <laughs> Well, dreamers and doers, here is the format, the moment you've been waiting for, we've been waiting for. Each week, we have the opportunity to sit down with someone that we have identified as a dreamer and a doer. And we give them the opportunity not only to share at least one of their dream stories uh, and, and part of their ambitions, but also to, we want to be real and want to be honest and talk about, you know, what do the steps look like to step towards your dream? And we hope that it's going to encourage you uh, not to... To, uh, not to get tired and to give up, but to be, if anything, encouraged and hopefully inspired to really go after your big dream. Yep. And right now we've got our second trivia question. This one does come with a prize. And so if you will, um, if you can get this answer and be the first person in the chat, we'll send a prize directly to your house. So this one is, what was the first toy to be advertised on television? What was the first toy to be advertised on television? Well, while you all are thinking and hopefully commenting in the chat box below, let's meet our dreamer and doer today. Her name is Julie Kerwin. Julie Kerwin is the creative superpower behind the first female action figures created specifically for children. She's a voracious researcher, writer, and thinker on topics of gender toys, creativity in children, and the power of play. Hi, Julie. Hi, guys. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. This is yeah. exciting. Yeah. Uh, we are we are tickled and thrilled to, to have you on. It is great to see you. So, Julie, right now, if I look outside, our weather here in Oklahoma kind of resembles New York winter weather. It's a, There's a slight drizzle, and it's overcast. <laughs> it's actually sunny and bright here. It's cold, but it's sunny and bright here today. So. Well, how ironic. Maybe we could switch uh, climates here. Speaking of climates, I'd love to hear not just about the weather, Julie, and we're going to jump into our interview in just a moment. But, uh, you know, New York has definitely made the headlines, uh, you know, since COVID and our global pandemic. Can you just kind of just fill us in just right now, those of us that aren't in New York, what is just the current uh, vibe like right now for you and for everybody? Um, it's an interesting thing because it's so different now than it was in March, mm -hmm. that it feels alive, but it's really not alive here. Mm -hmm. um, so back in March, when everything was shut down and we were at the epicenter of the, of the COVID um, uh, period in the spring, uh, we were seriously in lockdown and uh, it was eerily silent, eerily silent. Um, my husband and I had a day, we ventured out for shopping for food, which was really the only thing you were allowed to do at the time. And we were walking home and we have lived on the same block for you know, 25, 30, almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. And um, we were walking home and we heard church bells. Hmm. And we looked at one another and we were stunned because we realized that we had never heard the church bells ever before because the traffic, the din of living where we live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan meant that they were always being drowned out by the mm -hmm. noise of the city. And it was a um, fairly profound moment for us, um, which led to even more. I mean, I, uh, the birds, I was hearing birds chirp in Central Park that I never heard, heard the birds. And I will tell you also, um, the, the squirrels have taken over. They come, <laughs> they come so close to you now. There's, they, I guess they, got, they, they decided they own the park. So now it's a very strange, very strange, um, odd experience. But as far as the city, um, there's a lot more traffic um, and there's an illusion 
of city and reopening, but the schools are cl largely closed. My son is, uh, he's a freshman in high school and he is um, currently at the desk in our living room taking, you know, or dining room actually table, uh, used going to school. He was going once a week for two hours and 40 minutes. And then the, the mayor shut that down. So, um, so we're still very much under this um, kind of uh, lockdown in theory, experience, even though uh, restaurants are open, you can sit outside at a restaurant. It's getting cold, but you can sit outside as a restaurant. Many of them are starting to build these, I call them like restaurants outside their restaurants, yeah, but you know, yeah. they're desperately trying to stay in business. Right. Um, and we did on uh, the day after Thanksgiving, we went for a walk as we would normally do to see all of the Christmas decorations that have gone up in the stores and the windows in the city. And on it, I'm not going to lie. I was depressed. Um, there was nobody there. It was an absence of people that was shocking. So, uh, so it's a weird thing because your question, you know, it's so different from nine months ago, but it's still, we, we haven't recovered and I think it'll be a long time before we do. Well, you did a great job describing that. We're all wearing different shoes, of course, regardless of where we live uh, around the world, but know this from a distance we've been, we've been thinking about you. So thanks for, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I mean, obviously, my family is very lucky. We're together, we're safe, we're healthy, and we, we recognize that. We have friends all over the world, and some are not faring as well as we are. Yeah. yeah. Well, Julie, let's jump into it, um, and let's talk about dreaming and doing. Let's do um, it. Love asking this question. Um, would you consider yourself more of a natural dreamer or more of a natural doer? Well, I am a dreamer. And I have proof that I am a dreamer. I actually brought, look at this. This is my high school yearbook. Wow. And I'm going to show you evidence, hard evidence that I am a dreamer. The proof, uh, here it is. So I, I covered up everyone else because I value people's privacy. But oh. here is my photo. Oh my and God. my photo is a quote. Hmm. Everyone got to put a quote. And my quote is, to know is nothing, to imagine is everything mm. so there you have it i evidence of my youth i am a dreamer and um and i always have been no surprise here uh getting a chance to know you over the last couple of years speaking of your youth um i'm really excited for uh, those that are watching and listening to get a chance to know just the young dreamer. So can you take us back, Julie, just a few years? And can you talk about what life was like growing up? Sure. Um, so I, I had, you know, listen, I don't know if it was interesting. I don't know if it was unusual. I actually think it was somewhat normal for the time in which I was a young girl. But um, it, my mother was an interesting person in terms of what she wanted us to be exposed to. So I had no, we had no, we didn't have Barbies in my house. And that was, um, that was a deliberate decision on her part. Um, uh, I had what was called, I had these sunshine family dolls um, that represented, uh, you know, the, a mother and a father and a family. We we had Playmobil. That was actually a huge, uh, one of my favorite things that my brother and I would play with. But uh, the thing that took up the most space in my playroom that I would have all my toys in were blocks. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, buckets and buckets, those milk crates, those old plastic milk crates, and they were filled to the brim with blocks. And um, so that, you know, obviously my what my mother was trying to do, which is Ironically, what we try to do with I Am Elemental is create opportunities for open-ended creative play. Mm -hmm. And so that was, um, uh, you know, something that she instilled in me at a very young girl, as a, as a very young girl. I also loved books mm -hmm. from the time that, you know, she filled my room with books. You can see there's books over my head. Um, and, um, and so reading was uh, another activity that I spent a lot of time doing. I had always had a book in my hand. I always had a book. I was one of those people who could read in the car without getting sick back in the day. Mm -hmm. and so everywhere I went, I had a, a, my nose in a book. And this proved to be really helpful and useful because something very sad and tragic happened in my childhood. And so my mother got sick when I was a little girl. And so I lost her. She died when I was eight years old. And um, and so, you know, obviously this was not uh, this was a difficult thing to have to navigate and manage. 
but I always felt that the books provided my sustenance and, and kind of allowed me to understand that there's like a million different ways to live a life. And that just because my lived experience didn't look like everyone else's in my neighborhood and in my home and my friends, um, that that wasn't a bad thing. It was a sad thing, but it wasn't a bad thing. And so that was really, and, and I also will say, you know, one of the, one of the things that we say in I am elemental, we, we, we like a quote and we say, um, uh, show me a child, give me a child of seven and I will show you the man. And the idea behind that is that your core is formed when you're very young. Now I will say we also believe, um, you know, uh, always learning. Michelangelo, not the Ninja Turtle, the artist, <laughs> always learning. So we believe both things, that I I believe I'm a work in progress and that I will be one until the day that I die. But I also recognize that kind of my core was formed as a very young girl. And so I'm grateful for the fact that my mother was such a wonderful mother and a wonderful person. And so she created um, opportunities for me to form a very strong core um, that allowed me to manage and navigate my world um, despite the tragedy. Wow. Well, it sounds like you were very fortunate uh, with your upbringing, Julie, and the values that were just passed on and instilled in you. If you don't mind, I want to hone in just for just a moment on the decision not to have Barbie dolls in your house. There must have been a philosophy and intentionality with that decision has that carried over into your parenting or even just beliefs of I am elemental of things maybe that, you know, parents should be looking out for or cautious of when, you know, uh, just buying what might just seem like just a casual toy, you know, out on the, out on the shelf at a store. Well, you know, it's, I'm always, one of the things that we say in I am elemental is that we are not anti-dollar, anti-princess. And I certainly played with the Barbies when I went to my neighbor's house two doors down. Kathy McCann, she had Barbies. <laughs> um, but, uh, but what we say is, if you give a girl a different toy, she will tell a different story. That's one of our taglines. And, and so the, what we argue in the I am elemental universe is this idea that um, a doll and an action figure have two very different purposes. And so with a Barbie, you know, she has hair that you brush and clothes that you change. Um, and she, you know, her knees don't bend and there's, there's only a certain play pattern there. Um, but with an action figure, um, you know, you have the opportunity to save the world. It's kind of more of an active play. It inspires a different play pattern. Um, and so that is why we exist, was to create an opportunity for different play pattern. I also want to say, you know, my brother and I were very close and we always played together. And so one of the things that's so interesting to me about I Am Elemental is that while the business was born out of a question, which is where are the action figures for girls because I'm raising two boys I don't have a daughter myself I really was very deliberately in trying to ensure that they were really cool and fun to play with so that everyone would want to play with them and so you know we argue um, that it's just as important to put a female action figure in the hands of a boy as it is a girl. Because when we talk about this idea of gender equality, you know, if you want to see it happen, you have to, I say you have to change the way they play in order to change the way they think. Mm -hmm. And just very quickly, I'll tell you my favorite story about that. So I had a mom who had two boys who were younger than mine, who loved the I'm Elemental action figures. And one day she came up to me very excited and she said, Julie, she said, I have to tell you the story. I was walking past the door of their playroom and I heard my son say, here she comes. She's coming to save the day. And I realized that I had never before heard him say that. So he had taken these female action figures and incorporated them into his regular play routine with his other action figures. But here he was already just naturally finding different ways in which to make the story unfold. And that's, you know, so I, you know, I do want to be clear that 
you know, if I had had a daughter who asked for a Barbie, I think that I probably would have bought her the Barbie. I don't, I don't, I'm not, um, I'm not putting a hard line there, but you know, I was growing up in the seventies. It was the Ms. Magazine and, you know, a certain, uh, kind of ideology was brewing and I think it was a good one and that it achieved what it needed to achieve for the time and that's what my mother was aiming for. That's good. Julie, it it strikes me in the way that you're creating um I mean visible pathways for for any any you know gender to see that you know it's possible for again any gender um, in the same way that when you were as a child you read books that gave you different perspectives and showed that maybe you know life isn't so cookie cutter um, and so I think that's very very cool um, well I wanted to ask did you know that you wanted to be a toy maker from a young age obviously your mom was very intentional about it um, and then you know how did the idea and the formation of actually I am elemental come about um, I had no idea. I call myself an accidental toy inventor. So that gives you an idea of that. No, this was not anything at all that I planned. Um, I, and I, it, I will, I'll tell you, it's funny. I showed you my high school yearbook, but in my fifth grade yearbook, they asked us to say what we wanted to be when we grew up. Mm -hmm. And I refused. I insisted. Mm -hmm. My girlfriend Jane and I put undecided. We were the only two people in the fifth grade yearbook who put undecided because I said, oh, what am I going to say? I'm going to say that I want to be a world famous, you know, I don't know, actress or something. And then someday I'm just a mom. And what is that? I mean, I'm going to look back and say, well, you know, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. you know, this, this is the kind of person that I was in the fifth grade. Um, so I had no idea. And even when I went off to college, I had no idea. I changed my major three times. Um, I have my certification to teach high school English. After graduation, I went and got a law degree and I never practiced law. So clearly, um, I was not someone. And there are wonderful, amazing people who know from a very young age what they want to be and what they want to do. And I was not that person. Um, and I did choose to be a mom. Isn't that the ha ha ha? In fifth grade, I was so afraid I would not do anything. But you know, just obviously having lost my own mother, that became a huge priority for me when I became a mother. Um, so how did the idea come? You're not going to believe it, Carolyn. It was a dream. You asked me if I was a dreamer or a doer. I had a dream. It's true. This is a true story. So I was, um, we were asking the question, why does Spider-Man, now, Remember, you have to go back quite a long time. You have to go back eight years because it was very different. It, as weird as it seems, it was very different just eight years ago. And so we were asking this question and we were saying, well, why does Spider-Man appeal to a boy of four and a man of 40, but there's no female equivalent? Because you have to understand this is before Wonder Woman, before this, nobody was asking this question. Nobody was thinking this. The Wonder Woman action figures that were being sold on the market were being designed for adult male collectors because 90 percent of the wonder woman audience eight years ago was male um so these are the things that were going on in my head and i went to a lecture my sons were at a single sex school at the time and i went to a lecture with this woman named joanne deke she's a brain expert and she started out by saying listen i'm a scientist everything i'm going to tell you is fact so we were all sitting there, these parents wanting to hear what she was going to say. And one of the things that she said was girls and boys are as different from the neck up as they are from the neck down. Mm. And I was so stunned by this. And I went home that night and I was laid in bed with my husband as we went to fall asleep. And I said, what would I have to do to an action figure to make it appeal to a female brain? And I went to sleep and I woke up and I was like, oh my gosh, I know the answer. And I took a blank periodic table of elements and I started writing in character traits, courage and creativity and wisdom. And my husband came home from work and I bought like 30 domain names that night. And the rest, <laughs> of it, seriously, and the rest, as they say, is history. But it was, I, I dreamt it and I woke up with this answer. Now, the thing that's funny about this is that I no longer believe that. So the, the other joke is, is that the whole idea for I Am Elemental mm 
was born out of this notion of the girl brain and the boy brain. But guess what? Brains have no gender. So, um, you know, obviously we could talk about hormones and things like that, which affect the way in which we think and behave. But ultimately, um, I find it really fascinating because the research, my own little research, not scientific, but legitimate, that has happened over the past six years of having I am elemental has led me to understand that, you know, it's one thing to talk about generalizations, but when you ask people to talk about their lives and their experiences and their thoughts, gender ceases to become the driving force in how they make their decisions. Well, Julie, I appreciate just being authentic and just really honest with us. More than you realize, I think you brought a lot of relief to our students that are watching and listening. Is the reality is, you know, whether it's in the, the fifth grade moment, like you described being asked the question, the proverbial, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, I feel like we we have a lot of pressure that's imposed upon us that we have to have the answer. So those students that are watching right now that their hashtag is IDK, I don't know. I think you brought a lot of relief that like it's OK and that I love you just talked about how you kind of quote unquote accidentally uh, found out uh, through you know through your dream, Julie. You have lots of quotes. I know that you that you like and different different sayings, but also to you know you talk about how everything that you do uh, and create it's kind of like a stew. So can you talk to us and describe just your journey in making this toy uh, dream come true and come to life? Uh, yeah, I it, it, I think everything is. The, your life is a stew and what you're you're putting all of the ingredients into the pot as you grow your entire life and and to your point i think it's really important one of the books that we just read you know as i i'm still a huge lover of books um i read aloud to my family my son and i he has his book i have my book i read to him he's a teenager i still read to him before he goes to sleep at night and we have a family book I'm always reading if we're sitting at a table. And so we just finished a wonderful book that I highly recommend by Wendelin Van Drainen called Wild Bird. We've read it a number of times. And I won't give you, I won't tell you anything about it. I will let you discover it for yourselves, except to say that the message, this underlying message that I love about the book is that so many people, as I mean, I, it, as we just discussed, so many people are always asking you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Or, or there's all this, I, there's this, I think social media creates an added pressure of this idea that you're supposed to know um, what you want to do much earlier than you really have to know what you want to do. And so the book says, instead of worrying about what you want to be when you grow up, you should be more concerned with who you want to be. What kind of person do you want to be? And so I think that that's a huge element of this concept of a stew, because I think that all of our experiences that we ex have along the way contribute to who we become and what we end up doing. And so, um, you know, for me, I think, you know, Another quote, Lynn Nottage, I, I saw a lecture. She's a Pulitzer Prize winning playwright. And I saw a wonderful um, talk with her and her husband, who's a documentarian. And he said, her quote is, replace judgment with curiosity. And that that allowed him to kind of have the compassion for other people that drove him toward documentary filmmaking. But I think it's also a very wise advice. And I think especially helpful as a teenager to look at the world with a curious eye and 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 be willing and and interested in learning anything and everything that you can because it all come it all goes in the stew and you won't know what you're going to do with it until later i never practiced law but as a toy maker i do use the skills that i learn to read a contract and negotiate things all the time so you have no idea when you're adding to your pot what you're going to do with it later and it doesn't matter it's just about filling it with as many ingredients as you can that's good keeping that curiosity is can be so is so important so Julie, I wanted to ask you, like, what powers your curiosity? What powers your creativity and gives you energy? Um, you know, it, I, it, I find 
aside from books, which obviously are a huge thing, and I love a great movie or a great story, um, but I do, I love history and I love art. And so, you know, because I live in New York City, I have the benefit of access to these wonderful museums. Um, and so, you know, the Metropolitan Museum of Art is a very, it's one of our favorites. We go, my boys were both in, one is currently and one used to be in the science program at the Natural History Museum. I mean, where do you think the idea came for the periodic table of elements being adapted for the elements of power. I was doing a mother and son science class for, you know, a decade mm -hmm. in each boy. Um, and the the frick, it's like, it's someone's mansion. You're walking through this man's house, looking at art. So all of these things inspire me, but then also history. I really, I urge you, you know, history is just, it's storytelling. And so don't, because it's a subject in school doesn't make it not fascinating and interesting in and of itself. And so I urge you all to really embrace um, kind of uh, an exploration of history and on all levels. Michael, I'll wait, I'll wait for a history book for our next team read. Um, okay, I, think I want to have a few recommendations. So uh, I, I can give you a list actually. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put that in the show notes. <laughs> Well, Julie, I'd love to ask you, uh, being the big dreamer that you are, what's a big dream that you're working on right now? So, so when we launched I Am Elemental, we had no backstory and that was intentional because we kept saying we wanted the children to be the creators of the story themselves. We don't want to spoon, spoon feed them story. Um, but you have to listen to your customers and our customers want a story. And so, um, you know, and I've got, it's, it's taken me a while because um, we had people come and approach us. Nickelodeon came and Disney DreamWorks came and they said, we would like to meet with you. But I think that they all saw my Courage series and they envisioned uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or, you know, something like Teen Titans. But we have a periodic table of elements or an elements of power to a chart to fill out. So we have seven series of seven action figures. And so it wouldn't work. Um, I liken it, I say we're more Mount Olympus than we are, um, you know, kind of uh, DC superheroes. Mm -hmm. So it took a while to figure out what the story would be. Plus another one of our taglines is real heroes walk among us. And it was really important to me that the story that we create center around humans and not around the characters. But Plus, I want you to want to be all these powers. You know, one of the things that we say is all these superpowers are already inside of you and you have to choose to use them. So I didn't want like this really cute honesty and really snarky, you know, persistence because everyone would then want to be one power over another. And you're supposed to want to be them all. So it took me a while, but I have a story. And so that's what I've been working on. I have, um, I'm hoping hoping that someone will like my story and that when the pandemic is over, I was supposed to fly out to Los Angeles on March 12th of this year wow. to have meetings with people in the television industry about my story and everything got canceled. Um, but you know what? Uh, I was very depressed the first few months about it, but it has turned out to be a blessing because I have these five wonderful teenagers from around the world that I've really gotten to know now I used to just have a description of my characters and now I know my characters and I know who they are and what they sound like. So that's my creative output right now. Well, we are going to wait Julie with full anticipation. <laughs> I hope my, I really hope. I mean, we'll see, we'll see if someone wants it. So. And if you need any proof readers or anyone to experiment and test out these stories, just let us know. We'd be I more will. I to take you up on that. <laughs> Julie, there is a question that we like to ask each of our dreamers and doers. And it's to go back to, you know, either your middle school, your high school self. And these might not necessarily be, you know, years or decisions that you personally would change. However, if you had an opportunity to whisper one bit of advice into your ear around that age, would there be one bit of advice that you would give yourself? Yeah, uh, you know, my boys love a TV show. I don't know if you guys, it's not, I don't think it's live anymore, but it was called Mythbusters. Mm -hmm. And one of the hosts had a, had a, he had his own quote and his quote was, failure is always an option. Mm -hmm. And I was definitely a kid who only raised my hand when I knew the answer. 
Um, and my firstborn child is very much like me. Now he's a superstar in school. You know, he went all the way in college um, because he liked to make sure he knew the answer so he could raise it. But I learned from my younger son, who, by the way, is more often right than he's wrong, but who was always, from the time he was a young boy, willing to be wrong in order to le learn what was right or to take a risk and to and to answer a question um, and make a an educated guess. And it was a real lesson for me. You know, my child taught his mother that um, it's OK to make mistakes. And it was a huge lesson because I make mistakes every day running this business. I never ran a business before. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of fun to design the action figures. That's my favorite part of the I Am Elemental universe. But I have to run a company. And this is all new for me. And so, um, and so I make mistakes all the time. And so I think, and, and it's not, it's something I've had to learn how to do. And so that would be the advice that I would give my younger self. And I would say, lighten up, Julie. Like, it's only a mistake. A mistake is not fatal. And you actually learn more from your mistakes than you learn from knowing the answer. So um, I would give you all that same advice, the advice that no one gave me. Oh, Julie, I I love it. I know that I needed to hear it. I know our, our students need to hear it, too. So. For the last part of our interview, uh, we love doing something called Last Minute Link, um, where we give you one minute, 60 seconds to share whatever is on your heart, something encouraging for the big dreamer or the big, dro the big doer um, that's out there. And so we'd love to give you 60 seconds. Julie, are you ready? I am, but I am flipping it on you. Ooh. So what I do in I Am Elemental is I go everywhere and I wherever I go, I bring my giant shields and I make people pick their power and I call it a window into your soul. And so, of course, I've just said that you have all these powers inside of you. But Michael and Carolyn, I want you to share with your viewers which power you identify with the most, because I think it's really interesting to hear what people think of and how they think of power and how they think of themselves. So I'm going to ask Carolyn first. Carolyn, oh, thank you for your me power. What? She was nodding yes, so I felt like she knew already. <laughs> a little scared. So I'm going to give her a chance to think about it. Carolyn, what's your power? So I would say my power is courage. Um, and this is something that I discovered probably about three years ago, um, especially in reading about Brene Brown. So love, <laughs> we, we get to talk a lot about books today, um, but talking about the courage um, to have to be vulnerable. Um, and so for me, Julie, even in the middle school advice, I think I would say I'm very similar. I'm very scared of being wrong or making mistakes. And so the power of being courageous enough to put myself out there, um, to share about who I am um, and who I really am, that takes courage. And to me, that's a superpower. Uh, I agree. I love <laughs> it. Okay, Michael, your turn. All right. Persistence. Mm. And the way that I think I am mental would describe it is persistence is finishing what a person starts. And that didn't describe me in my childhood and growing up. I unfortunately started a lot of things. I was fantasized with ideas, but I wasn't necessarily someone who followed through. And so um, persistence and, and Carolyn may not or head to this knows the story about a couple of weeks ago, I was in an Ironman race. So a triathlon race and uh, encountered a very difficult moment during the last half of the marathon. And so it was already a tremendously long day. And so uh, I, didn't, I didn't fly out to Mexico to walk the last half of a marathon, but that's what I had to do in order to finish. And so I would say persistence. Congratulations, that is wonderful. Now I'm gonna add to it, I brought in another, it's I am creativity and um, and obviously we're everything, but we've talked a lot about dreamers and creativity today. But here's the thing I want to talk to your audience about mm -hmm. is that creativity, you think of the word creativity and you think about like drawing or art or some sort of creative endeavor. But the reality is, is that every single day of your lives, you are using your power of creativity to create your life. Mm 
That is what you are doing. You are creating a life and you are responsible for it. So there's a lot of factors outside of our control, but the reality is, is that the life that you live is yours and yours alone and you are creating it. And so when I go around and ask people this question, not many kids pick creativity. And I don't have a problem with what you pick. You can pick whatever power speaks to you, just like Michael picked persistence and Carolyn picked courage. But I want you to think about creativity a little bit differently. Don't be afraid of what the word means because you are living it. And that is my last minute link. Wow. Julie, I won't, I won't uh, recall all parts of the story, but I believe there was a study that was done with a group of students and they were asked at a particular age and it may have been in kindergarten or first grade. And so the class was asked, you know, who here considers themselves? And I don't know if the word creative was used or like an artist, you know, and 100% of the hands were raised. The same question was asked in the fourth and fifth grade, maybe half of the class raised their hands. And then by high school, almost nobody was left raising their hands in that, in that class. That's powerful what you shared. Thank you. That's a great study. I'm going to have to find it, but I agree. I, thank you. Well, Julie, we're going to give you just a short break. So don't go too far because it's really going to be short. But Carol and I are just going to take a quick moment and we are going to recap a couple of our favorite parts of the interview, which you made it very hard to do. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Carolyn, we were put on the spot there. That wasn't that wasn't scripted out or anything. That wasn't scripted, but man, was I ready. <laughs> So good, so good. Well, favorite part, Carolyn? What what sticks out? I know there were a lot, but what sticks out uh, to you the most? This one really, it, it is a, a lot of notes, um, a lot of note taking. I would say one of the big things is uh, the stew. Um, and this is, I've been thinking about this more and more about the experiences that we have, especially in the pandemic of, you know, we're about to end 2020 and enter into a new year and kind of figuring out like, what was, uh, I mean, in a sense, like what was the point of this year? Um, and hopefully finding out like what that point was, um, but to really use this year to, I, I've been in my mind seeing it as the year of DIY. Uh, and so like, what are the things that I can learn? And maybe that bread recipe that I learned this year will come in, come in some serious handiness in eight years or whichever. Uh, but that's what, that's what I've been kind of simmering on lately. No, that's good. I was going to say something along the same lines. I believe that's when Julie began talking about, you know, it's not about the do, but it's more about the who and who you are and who you are uh, becoming. I, I love just the thought, just being a, being a parent, you know, when she shared about uh, just part of their philosophy is if you give, you know, a child a different kind of toy that you'll change the way that they think. Uh, and that really challenges me, you know, as a parent, uh, even thinking back to her story, you know, of her, of, of her mom, you know, and just, just the type of intentionality, you know, that I would have with my kids. And I hope those that are watching that have kids, you know, would have intentionality with theirs. And that exercise at the end that you and I were asked to do, I think everybody needs to, to wh whether you buy an action figure or not, I think that would just be a great exercise to, uh, to practice. I agree with you. That was very, very fun. Well, we said it wouldn't be long. Let's bring Julie back. Thank you. You're still with us in New York, right? Pardon me? You're still with us in New York. I am still with you in New York. Awesome. Yeah. She's read three books in that conference. <laughs> yeah, I've read them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and you name it. You're funny. So, Julie, we have a feature on our website. And it's an opportunity for those that might not be able to tune in live, you know, for this interview uh, to be able to ask our guest a question. And so we have one of our precious students who has an amazing story, actually, about a current cause uh, that she's working on. But her name is Jasmine, and she has a question for you this morning. Are you ready? I'm ready. Here we go. Hi, my name is Jasmine, and I am 12 years old. Julie? When do you know when it is time to shift your focus to another goal, project, or passion? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so first of all, you know, we talked about dreamers and doers, obviously, and I came down on the dreamer side. But one of the things that you have to recognize is that a, a dream is not an action. And so you have to do in order to to 
have an idea and then see it through. There's a lot of doing. And as I just mentioned, there's a lot of failing. And so the thing that I, you know, even with this television show I'm creating, trying to create, um, you know, it might not ever happen. There's a lot of people who create things that don't end up happening. That doesn't mean you don't do it. So what I say, Jasmine, is I, I, I say you draw, you take the train to the last stop. Um, and so it's really it's towards Michael's point of persistence. You don't want to give up. So you keep going until there's no going any further. Yeah. And that is something that you will know. You And it's not the mistake or the failure that will be the last stop necessarily, but you want to push through, um, even if it means walking the rest of the triathlon, you, you push through until the end. And I trust me when I say that you will know when you're at the last stop at the train station, but, um, but that's my advice to you is that you really, I think the, the world is littered with people who walked away too soon. And so um, it's okay to fail at it, but make sure that you fail all the way. That's what I would say. Because guess what? You probably won't fail if you go all the way. Mm. That's good. That was a hard question. I'm glad you didn't flip the script back on us. <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it was well. It was a hard question and not a hard question because obviously yeah. anyone who has started a small business has to ask be asking yourself that question all the time, Jasmine. So yeah. it's a good question. You know, it's interesting as you were as you were sharing near the end. I and you brought it up, so I I, I went back to the race that I just briefly described, and you know, after I crossed that that finish line, Julie, and even the next morning. What I as I began to reflect, and I still have more reflecting to do, I really feel that the demons that I faced, it was a long 13.1 miles, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't physical. It was really the battlefield in my mind yes. that I was really ready. And then I thought back to it, I'm like, you know, it actually really wasn't that bad. It, 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 once you push it through, and I, I like how, how you even described it, giving us the imagery, you know, of that last train stop. So, yeah. um, and don't be afraid to fail. No, it's powerful. No. Well, that's, that's it. Well, that's Julie, all I got. <laughs> Julie, we knew this would be great. Uh, it was so powerful. Uh, and I just don't say this to say this, but, you know, truly a conversation that that made us better. And I know it's making those that are watching and listening better as well. Uh, we'd love just to close out by giving you a chance. And then I actually have a follow up question. But uh, those that are just turned on and they're interested, they want to learn more about you or the I'm Elemental action figures. How can they find you? Well, we're on all the usual social media sites. So you can go to I Am Elemental Toy for uh, Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. Although I'm not a big fan of having teenagers on social media, I know that you are. And you can find more of my quotes and my thoughts there. Um, and also, I will say for the, these wonderful viewers and, and whatnot, we will, and you don't even know I'm doing this, um, I will put in a code, uh, Dreamers code code for 20% off on all of your purchases with I'm Elemental if you're interested in actually having the manifestation of your superpowers um, and you put in dreamers, you will be able to get a 20% discount. Yeah. Amazing. And you already know I'm taking advantage of that to get the rest of the collection, which is my last question for you, Julie. So I I really enjoyed looking at the periodic table, reading the descriptions of each of the action figures. But if you had someone that, you know, they're not going to buy the set quite yet and they're going to pick just one, do you have any particular bit of just advice that you would give that person on how to make that selection, whether it's for themselves, the, uh, the kid inside the adult or, or, or if it happens to be for a kid? You know, it's funny. I actually, I mean, my only advice is when you go to my website, you will see that you, um, if you're, if you're not buying the full set, you get to pick your power. And so you, it's so personal, you know, people really, um, I, I, I've, um, I'm, I have a warehouse for the big stuff, but the, the smaller sets I pack. And, um, and so I'm always, I'm always excited to see what someone will pick. And I, every single bag, uh, you know, that I put together is different. So that's what you get to do. That's the fun of it for you. And I would never, ever tell anyone which power they should pick. Yeah. 
Oh. Well said, Julie. Julie, again, thank you for making us better and thank you for the way that you're influencing the world. Thank you for having me here and thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk with you. I loved it. I love you. I love what you guys do. And uh, I hope 2021 proves to be a better year for all of us. So mutual and agreed. Thank you, Julie. Bye, guys. Well, Carolyn, you know, I just have I have to say, and I don't think I said this to you yet, but I was just scrolling through my phone and we brought our kiddos into a, a store. And so they were just looking, we were doing some toy window shopping for, for the holidays. And we took some pictures of different toys that they were interested in. And I sat on our couch last night as we're putting together the list. And it was just interesting. I don't wanna, I don't want to uh, downplay or talk negatively about the, the toys and the images that I saw, but you know, I was scrolling through these images and it was just like, it was just a toy. And something that's going to get played with for a few minutes or for a week and it's just going to be set aside and i just can't tell you how much it means to me that there's an action figure out there like i can hear my kids say daddy like where is the honesty shield or daddy where is curiosity and to have words like that attributes like that brought into my home are are just a a game changer so um I hope that was a good sales pitch for someone to go out there and learn more about I Am Elemental. If you'd like to learn more about LoveWorks Leadership, uh, a little plug for us, you can just visit, visit uh, loveworksleadership.org and you can find our previous 37 Dreamer and Doer uh, episodes, which are great, and also to be, be made aware of our other digital resources. For sure. And remember, real leaders, they don't blend in, but they stand out. Dream big. And do your dream. Bye, everybody.